variance. So uh, it just took a while to actually see why that was true. Um, so the odd writhe, uh, the affine index polynomial, oh, a synonym for that is the writhe polynomial. Um, and uh, you know, those are um, slice obstructions and concordance invariants. Another one is the henrich of polynomial, if you're familiar with that one. Um, that's also a concordance invariant. Um, then uh, for uh, knots which are homologically trivial, so by the way, I think I forgot to mention this. Um, so here on out, AC uh, stands for almost classical. And that just means um, that it's uh, ZH1 trivial and some thickened surface representative. Okay, um, so it's a small class of um, virtual. Okay, so um, we also have, uh, you know, these signature functions. So they have a, uh, you know, when you have a something that's uh, nearly homologically trivial, then you can just have a ciphered surface. So you can define things like signature functions, ciphered forms, and there's a whole bunch of um, slice obstructions you can get out of that. Um, there's this thing called coverings of knots or equivalently parity projection. Those are also uh, concordance invariants. And then the last one here um, is called the generalized Alexander polynomial, but it goes by lots of names. So this is called the Swalik polynomial. Uh, it's also called the Jager Kaufman Soler polynomial. So that was sort of its first um, uh, discovery back in the mid 1990s. And, um, you know, the, we use generalized Alexander polynomial because that's the name that Silver and Williams gave for an equivalent construction. It's just a little bit easier to think of it that way. Okay, so I've just thrown a lot of information at you. Um, do you have any questions about anything? I have a question. Fantastic. Can, can you ex explain a little more what almost classical mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. So the H1 it, trivial mean. Um, so if you have a, uh, a knot in a thickened surface, um, it's not necessarily homologically trivial, right? It can be um, represent some non-trivial homology class in the thickened surface. Um, when it does represent a homologically trivial class, then you know it bounds a ciphered surface. And so these have a special place in the theory of virtual knots. But there's not many of them. That's sort of the drawback. So um, there's 92,800 virtual knots up to eight, up to six crossings. Um, and only 76 of those are almost classical. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, but when they are almost classical, you have these very refined invariants, which give great bounds on things like the slice genus and stuff like that. Okay. All right, so um, unfortunately, none of these invariants um, can really help us with the um, question of Turayev. So we need something like a new idea here. So let me just give you the idea I started thinking about, um, and that's, you know, virtual knots really behave more like classical links than they do like um, classical knots. So just to give you sort of a, a simple observation about this. I've drawn a couple of links here. Um, for classical links, let's say you have two components. It's very common. Uh, sometimes you'll have one component which is not homologically trivial in the complement of the other component. And sometimes you have uh, a component which is homologically trivial on the complement of the other one. So that's you know an obvious thing. It doesn't seem to be too shocking that that's true. Um, but that is also what we have for knots and thickened surfaces, right? So you have some knots which are homologically trivial and some thickened surface and some which are not, okay? And so the idea is to try to make this um, kind of sketchy uh, situation a little bit more precise. So let's just erase all of the silly stuff and get down to business. Okay, so for classical links, we have Milner's 
uh, mu bar invariants. They are known to be concordance invariants of links. Um, in particular, they obstruct concordance to boundary links. And um, one thing that we know that's interesting about Milner's invariants is that if uh, the full set of the mu bar invariants vanishes, uh, that also implies the vanishing of the multivariable Alexander polynomial. Okay, so what we're gonna do is construct a parallel situation for virtual knots. These are one component virtual knots. Um, and we'll be calling them the extended je bar invariants. I'll tell you why we're using that character in a moment. That's a Russian character, je there. Um, it's due to bar to time, um, that symbol. Um, why we use that, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, these will be virtual knot concordance invariants. Uh, they obstruct concordance to almost classical knots. So almost classical knots are sort of playing the role of uh, like boundary links in the Milner theory. And they satisfy the property that if the um, full set of the je bar invariants or extended Milner invariants vanish, uh, that implies the vanishing of the generalized Alexander polynomial. So these will be always stronger than uh, the um, generalized Alexander polynomial as a slice of selection, or always at least as strong, I should say. Okay, so um, we'll do this with a four step process. Um, so first we have to figure out, you know, how do I actually go from virtual knots to links or some type of links? So we're gonna use this map, which is due to bar uh, which maps virtual knots to two component welded links. Um, but in doing so, we lose something. So we lose the geometric interpretation of virtual knot concordance that we get from Turiano. So we need to you know, retain some geometric information somehow. We're gonna do that with uh, Sato's tube map. Um, so once you've got those constructions and you know that they're functorial under concordance, uh, then it's just a matter of extending Milner's concordance invariance to welded links and to ribbon torus links. Okay, so that's not so... Um, complicated once you have the idea how to do it. It's just a matter of working out the details. Um, and then, you know, the composition is just the mu bar invariance for welded links together with the tube map and the zero map. And altogether that will give us our concordance invariance. Okay, um, so the applications we wanna look at are, you know, the one from the title will show that the virtual knot concordance group is not a billion. And then we'll also reduce to four out of 92,800 virtual knots from Green's table having unknown, unknown slice steps. Okay, any questions before we get down to business? Yeah, I mean, you are gonna explain the step one, are you? Uh, I'm gonna explain all the steps, hopefully. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's a good question, yeah. Just. Uh... Step one, <laughs> yeah, uh, the je construction. Okay, so um, first of all, let's remind ourselves what a welded knot is. Um, so you uh, introduce another uh, relation here on uh, virtual knot diagrams here inside this box, you know, you can have anything. Okay, and uh, the, uh, additional uh, set of moves is called this overcrossings commute move. And it just says that you can replace any overcrossing arc with any other overcrossing arc. Um, and so welded knots are the set of virtual knot diagrams uh, mod out by the uh, regular extended Rhino-Eister moves together with um, this overcrossings commute relation. Okay, so I'm sure you're familiar with those. Okay, <laughs> so we'll move on. Okay, so um, what is the je construction? So first of all, the je uh, construction uh, is due to Barnatan. Um, he mentioned it in a few talks, but he didn't actually uh, write a paper about them. Um, so uh, anyway, we learned about it from his, his talks. And so we're just gonna talk about some basic properties of them. Um, so first of all, how do you use the je construction? So the idea is you start with any virtual knot diagram and we're gonna add a second component uh, to this uh, uh, knot diagram. Here it's drawn with this blue arc. 
And uh, you do this first at each crossing by adding in um, two little arcs, which are both over crossings. Um, and then, you know, you get all these little tiny arcs, which are on your picture, and then you're just going to connect them end to end arbitrarily. Okay. When you're doing this, of course, you'll create some new crossings, right? So you just make any new crossing that you create virtual. Um, so I've drawn sort of, I'll give you an example in a second. And uh, so you're probably saying, well, why is that well-defined? Um, well, remember, we're doing this all up to the overcrossings commute relation. And you'll notice here that you have two overcrossings in my in the picture here. Uh, and so since overcrossings commute, it doesn't actually matter which order you do them in. So you know, in the paper, I wrote out a proof why that's the case, but it's um, essentially just what I said there in a sentence. So that's why it's well defined, at least in terms of finding the, the omega component. Um, so here's just an example of the construction for the virtual trefoil uh, of what it would look like. Uh, we have a virtual knot diagram, we add the component, and that gives us um, a two component welded link. And you can actually use, uh, you know, and this is what's used in the paper is a slightly different definition. You don't actually need full welded, uh, you know, equivalence, you really only need the fact that the overcrossing component uses this overcrossings commute relation. Um, but you know, for today's purposes, we'll just keep it simple and just talk about up to welded equivalence. On the right, the two bottom crossings are virtual? Yes, that's right, yeah. Exactly, thank you. So. Why, why can't you just remove this blue component? Um, well, for this one, um, you can't. So it's not easy to see why that's uh, the case. Um, oh. But I'll show you in a minute uh, an invariant that will show why you can't. So for a classical knot, you, could you can absolutely remove the additional component. But for a virtual knot in general, you can't always pull it off. Good question. Okay, so of course you have to show that this is invariant under the Reitermeister moves. And so here's just a, you know, a short proof. This proof is in the paper with Bowden, um, you know, of why it's the case um, that it is invariant under these Reitermeister moves. Um, a, a similar proof was given by Barnett in a couple of his talks, um, but this is just how it's, it basically works out. So you just have to go through the, the little argument and it's it's fine. Okay, um, so just a couple of lemmas about the Zhe construction. Um, so first of all, um, the Zhe map uh, preserves concordance. So if you have two uh, concordant virtual knots, uh, then the Zhe of them will be concordant welded links. And so the proof of this is very similar, is remember birth, deaths, and set, uh, very simple. Um, birth, deaths, and saddles do not involve crossings, right? So in terms of the Zhe component, they don't actually show up. They're not actually involved in it whatsoever. Um, so once you've shown that it's uh, invariant under the extended Reitermeister moves, then you, know, you don't really have to, to do much to show that it's actually um, concordance invariant. And so getting back uh, to Roger's question here, um, if you have any almost classical knot, then je of k uh, splits as a two component, almost classical link. And so the idea behind why this is true, I'll just sketch a little proof here is that, um, you know, here I have on the left-hand side, you know, just some, um, picture of a knot diagram on the surface, you can think of this just as, you know, say a classical knot if you want. And in that case, uh, you can argue that you just have to, you can just always pull uh, this extra component right off. So it's pretty clear that that's the case for an, uh, a classical knot, um, but it's true also for uh, any almost classical knot. This requires a little bit more effort, not much more. Okay. 
All right, so before we move on to step two, let me ask if there's any other questions. None? Okay. Okay, wonderful. All right, step two, the tube map. Okay, so I'll just, you know, briefly remind you about broken surface diagrams. So, you know, if you have a knotted surface in S4, um, you can draw it as an immersed surface in R3. Um, you'll have some uh, singularities, which you, uh, you know, resolve the double lines uh, in the way that's indicated in the picture there. Um, so you just break it along the sheet, which has a smaller um, fourth coordinate, let's say. Okay, and if you have a uh, welded knot diagram or welded link diagram, uh, you can make a uh, ribbon torus using the following set of rules. So along any arc of the diagram, you're going to replace it with a, a tube, um, uh, just an, you know, an annulus there. And then at a classical crossing, we draw a picture that looks like this. So you have sort of one thing passing through the other. And then at a uh, virtual crossing, you know, you just have uh, two, uh, the two cylinders are just passing over one another like so. And so if you do this, uh, you get a, a nice picture of a uh, broken surface diagram for what's called a um, ribbon torus knot. So uh, I'm sorry, Mike, I should know this. Um, uh, your uh, choice of the horizontal tube in the middle picture going under or going over from left to right and then going uh, under on the other right hand side is dependent on the orientation of the over arc. Um, so are you talking about the classical picture or the um... classical picture? I, I yeah, the, I understand what's going on with the virtual picture. Oh, right. The, um, so you, you have an over under information on the right. uh, on the small tube. That's right. So so if I'm going if the over arc is pointing from left to right, then the tube first crosses under and then crosses over. Um, let's see if I understand. Let's see. Uh, I think it doesn't matter what the orientation is. You draw the same picture in both cases. It is sometimes easier to represent this as a moving um, moving picture of sort of stacked R3s. Sure. And then you, the, 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 the tube, the, the circles come together and they part, one circle passes through the other circle. The, the one corresponding to the under arc passes through the circle corresponding to the over arc. Right, but I think so, that, uh, uh, I think there's a there's a difference between that depends on the orientation of the over arc. Um, at least that's that's what my feeling is. But I, sure. yeah, well, I Carry mean, on. it depends on you know. I mean, the 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 un, <clears throat> the, the uh, disc which you pass through has got an orientation, so it depends on whether you pass through from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top. Ah, exactly. So that that. Yeah, yeah. That 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 answers it. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, thanks. That's wonderful. <laughs> it's much better than I could have explained it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so just a few properties of the tube map. Um, so if you have um, two um, equivalent welded links. Uh, then their tubes are isotopic uh, as knotted surfaces in S4. Um, so that's a proof due to Sato. And then um, also for any uh, welded link, uh, you can take the group. So this is just the regular wording or presentation um, of the welded link, um, which is you know, a welded uh, knotter link invariant. 
And uh, that is isomorphic to the fundamental group of the complement of the tube of the link. So this gives you a nice geometric interpretation uh, of the, um, the group of a welded link. Okay, and by G of L there, I just mean you know, the, the wording group is defined in the usual way. Okay, so um, we wanna consider these things up to uh, concordance invariance. Okay, so if you have uh, two ribbon torus links and S4, uh, then we'll say they're concordant, you know, if in uh, S4 times I, uh, there's a, a three manifold, uh, each component of which is just a thickened torus, S1 times S times one times I, uh, such that uh, when you intersect the three manifold with S4 times one or with S4 times zero, it gives you your original ribbon torus. Okay, so it's the standard sort of definition of a uh, concordance. And so in this paper with Bowden, we showed that if you have two uh, concordant uh, welded links, then their tubes are also uh, concordant. Um, so it's just a handle decomposition argument. That's uh, not uh, too difficult. Um, I will point out that this is the only place in the argument that requires the smooth hypothesis. Um, so it's possible that all the invariants that we're going to define are also topologically uh, slice obstructions, but um, we couldn't figure out how to, you know, beef it up to a <laughs> topological setting. Um, so we are using the smooth hypothesis here, but nowhere else. Okay. All right. Um, so just a little recap of what we've done so far. Um, so if you have um, uh, virtual knot, you take the je construction for that virtual knot that gives you a two component welded link. Uh, and then you apply the tube map to give you a ribbon torus link in S4. And so what's happened here is that uh, when we went from virtual knots to welded links using the je construction, we've lost a piece of geometric information. Um, we're going to get that geometric information back by applying the tube map. And then at the level of the group, where we define these extended Milliner invariants, uh, there's no loss of information at the level of the group. Okay, so the next step we have is just to um, construct these mu bar invariants of welded links. Okay, so this part is you know just the standard sort of Chen Milner theory applied to welded links. Okay, so just a few um, reminders here. So if I have uh, a group G, then I can take its lower central series just by these um, uh, iterations of the commutator subgroups. Now you get a sequence of normal groups. And uh, we have the nilpotent quotient, which is just G divided by the qth term of the lower central series. Okay, so um, first thing to point out, if you have uh, two welded concordant virtual links, um, then uh, if you have a concordance between their tubes, uh, then there's an isomorphism at the level of the groups. So what I mean by that is that uh, the qth nil potion quotient of the, uh, the group of the welded link is isomorphic to the qth nil potent quotient of um, the complement of the tube of L. And that's the same thing as um, the qth uh, nilpotent quotient of the complement of the cobordism lambda. And that's the same thing um, with the other knot, as long as the two are concordant. So I know a lot of you will recognize this. This is essentially the same argument that um, is used by Stallings and um, by Kasson to show that the uh, Milner invariants are concordance invariants. And it's, just, it's the same argument. So there's no difference between them. You just have to be a little careful about what you mean by longitude. Okay. So this is just the standard proof uh, that you know, Stallings and Kasson used to show that the Milner invariants are concordance invariants. So, so this argument doesn't work for the fundamental group. You have to make the, the quotients, I guess. Well, so, um, yeah, that's right. That's right. 
Yeah. So it's true for the nil potent quotients. So, I, I mean, it's this theorem, it's a Stallings theorem type of argument. Okay, so um, for the, uh, you know, the next step, of course, is to construct, you know, these Milner invariants. So uh, following, you know, what Milner and Chen did, uh, you take, you know, the nilpotent quotients of the group of the welded link, and then you're just going to rewrite the presentation in a nice way. Um, so the same thing is true as is in the classical case. Um, the proof is basically the same. Uh, so things to point out here is that uh, if you have an M component link, you have one generator for each component. You know, of course that depends upon the base point. Uh, and you have this nice presentation here uh, consisting of commutators with the image of the longitude and the Qth term of the lower central series. Uh, and then you also have uh, FQ, which is the, uh, the Qth commutator subgroup of the free group on M large. Okay, so it's, it's the same thing as the original uh, argument that's given by Chen and Milner. Okay, and so uh, you then take the Magnus expansion of these words here. Uh, so, you know, just to remind you in case you have forgotten, um, for each uh, generator AI, you map it to one plus AI, and then you have AI inverse, you know, you just use the uh, geometric series basically to define uh, what the, in the inverse is, goes to one minus AI plus AI squared minus AI cubed and so on and so forth. And uh, then you know, if you take this or any word that's in the, um, Free group, you get a Magnus expansion, uh, and you think of this as a power series expansion, and you take these um, epsilon j's, which are uh, the coefficients that occur in that expansion, and uh, you define uh, mu of jk of L uh, just to be uh, the coefficient of you know, applying the Magnus expansion to the longitude for the kth component. All right, so by the way, this last digit as always corresponds to uh, the component that you're using to define the longitude. And then you have the same indeterminacy as usual, uh, which is that you uh, delete one term from the sequence, you know, defining the coefficient, you cycle all of them, and then you take the greatest common divisor. Okay, so um, I should point out, by the way, um, that uh, a great source to learn about this is um, Roger Fenn's book, Techniques in Geometric Topology, <laughs> which is where I learned a lot of this uh, stuff from. Um, so it has a lot of really useful information. And it's very clear and easy to read. Okay, um, available at booksellers now. <laughs> Okay, so all that is just sort of a review. And you know, you do the same thing for welded links. Um, so you just take uh, mu bar of uh, L is uh, these coefficients modulo the indeterminacy. And because of this Stallings uh, type theorem, uh, these automatically become welded concordance invariants of links. Okay. Um, so um, I'll also point out here something that's kind of interesting. So. There's a, a recent paper by, um, let me make sure I get all the authors right, um, Miyazawa, uh, Yada, uh, Wada, and Yashuhara. And so they also are interested in uh, welded links of uh, Milner's invariants of welded links. They're looking at the case of isotopy rather than concordance. And they have a nice uh, proof, which is different than what's in Milner's paper. Uh, that gives you that they are also uh, you know, isotopy invariants, but it's also true uh, that they're concordance invariants. So our invariants are exactly the same. There's no difference between them. Um, it's just that they're both isotopy and concordance invariants. So it's interesting uh, piece of information that I think. Their proof is very nice too. So I think you should read that.
Okay, so I've also given you a lot of information, so maybe I'll pause for a second to ask if you have any questions. Okay, so what do I mean by the extended mu bar invariants? These are our jeu bar invariants. Um, well, first of all, um, there's a simplification that you can use uh, that makes uh, pleasant to compute these things. So there's this thing called the extended group. Uh, there's lots of different versions in the literature. Uh, there's you know one due uh, to um, Mantarov, there's one due to Bartikov, there's one uh, Bartikov and Don Jerry. Uh, there's lots of different versions of them. We're just going to use the one that's due to Bowden, Godro, Harper, Nikas, and White because it's a little bit na more natural with the terms of the, in terms of the Jure construction. Um, so the difference is um, with the you know the classical group of a knot is that you have instead of one generator in each crossing, you have two generators. So um, you commutate with this um, sort of extra variable V. So V you're thinking of as an auxiliary variable. You do that for both positive and negative type crossings. And there's you know, no uh, relation at any virtual crossing. And uh, you define this thing called the extended group, uh, which is just you take um, the uh, half arcs of your diagram, you add in, a auxiliary variable v, and then you take it relative to these um, generators that I've depicted above. Okay, um, so this is called the extended group of a uh, virtual knot. Okay, and the reason why this is useful for our purposes is that um, the extended group of a virtual knot is the same thing as the group of the jure of the knot. So if you take a um, any virtual mm -hmm. knot, you take jure of k, um, then the regular old Wardinger group of the knot is the same thing as the extended group of the knot. So this is sort of a useful um, fact. Okay, and so the proof is very simple. You just have to write out um, what the effect is on uh, you know, the generators. And so I wrote out sort of the argument there, uh, but it's, uh, it's not, not difficult. So I reckon that Barnaton recognized that that was how the extended group came about. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think that's true. Yeah, I think that's what okay. happened. Yeah. Um, right. So I, I think you know his idea was you can use this construction to unify a lot of the various different constructions that occur in virtual knot theory. Um, and for example, so maybe uh, for your interest, you can do this for quandles too, right? So there's no reason not to do it for quandles, and you sure. can, you, def, you get extended invariance for quandles. So uh, I'll point out that uh, Suyoi Mukherjee also figured that out. So I'll give him. <laughs> I mean, is this some sort of? Um... Uh, biquandle? I actually didn't look at the biquandle case, just at the, uh, the quandle case. Yeah. So I'm not sure how that would work, but that's a very interesting question. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, so I know we're sort of running short on time here, so I'll just um, you know mention uh, sort of the main thing. Uh, you know, when you apply the all of these things together um, with the the Chen Milner theorem for welded links above, you know, composing with the Jura map, you get this extremely simple presentation for um, the nil potent quotients of the extended group. So you just have two generators, A and B. You have um, sort of one interesting relation, which is just the, uh, the commutator A, and you have this, you know, extended gem generator corresponding to um, the the knot, right, the longitudinal knot as it appears in je, the group of je of k. And, um, you know, if you were to apply this construction, you know, the, the regular old um, group, if you apply the construction, you wouldn't really get any new invariance, like you don't get any invariance from Milner's construction for knots. But surprisingly, when you actually do it for um, the extended group, you get some very interesting invariance. 
Uh, and so what you do is, you know, you just apply the same construction and this is just the composition again. So it's the Milner invariance of welded links composed with uh, the tube construction composed with the Je construction. And that just gives you uh, concordance invariance of virtual knots. Micah? Yeah. Uh, do they do this this thing on the right hand side of that equivalence? Is that in a group that you have some sort of reasonable control over or not? This over here? The epsilon J. Yeah. Do you have a reasonable control of that? I mean, do you know what it looks like? Yeah, so um, it's very easy when you're when you're doing the calculations, you know, it's the same way you do it with for Milner invariance. So uh, generally, you know, you the first several will vanish, right? And so the the first non-vanishing invariants are usually easy to compute. So I use a computer program to do it. I use um, GAP to help me with the um, calculations because uh, some of these longitudes can be extremely long. Like I have some that were like millions of characters long um, before you <laughs> reduce them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, so you know, it, it's computable when you um, are only looking at the, it's easy to compute when you're only looking at the, um, the first non-vanishing invariant. Okay, and so just a few properties here. Um, how, well, when should I stop in three minutes? Is that right? Yeah, sorry about that, Micah. Um, it was unfortunate we started late. That's okay, uh, I'll, I'll leave you wanting Wanting more, hopefully. <laughs> sure. Um, so you know the um, first thing to point out is that you know if you're uh, the generalized Alexander polynomial uh, has a very simple interpretation in terms of the Zurich construction. So the generalized Alexander polynomial is literally just the multivariable Alexander polynomial of the Zurich of K. Um, so there's lots of different constructions for the. Uh, generalized Alexander polynomial. There's ones coming from quandles. There's ones coming from um, biquandles. There's one coming from, uh, you know, like a st statistical mechanics point of view. But this gives you a particularly simple interpretation um, in terms of these, uh, you know, like uh, Alexander modules for the uh, these uh, this generalized um, Alexander theory, right? Okay, so it's just the multivariable Alexander polynomial of J of K. And so if you have something which is concordant to an almost classical knot, um, then that forces all of the bar J invariants to be zero. And so in particular, this forces the generalized Alexander polynomial to be zero and uh, the Henry triad polynomial, the affine index polynomial and the odd right polynomial are all trivial. Um, so this is sort of, you know, always going to be stronger than these other invariants that I mentioned before. And it's oftentimes more, uh, you know, can distinguish knots from being sliced, uh, even from the Rasmussen invariant. Um, so I'll just have to let you um, uh, wonder about why VC is not a billion <laughs> since we're out of time. So thank you so much. Well. Thank you very much, um, Micah. That was really interesting. Stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yeah. Would it be possible to, to have him continue a few more minutes and show us why it's not abelian? I'm okay. I can. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Um, so you do have to, you know, cons uh, do some modifications for the long virtual knot case. Um, so you have to define a joke construction for that. Um, so here I have a you know, two component uh, virtual string link. Um, you know, we add a component in sort of the usual way using the same construction, just adding an additional you know, blue string using the same rules. Um, nothing too surprising there. And you also have to do uh, a tube construction for long virtual knots uh, or string links. 
uh, I'll point out, I don't have to do much in this case because there's a nice paper um, by Odu. Um, make sure I get all the authors here. I think it's Odu, Bellingeri, uh, Wagner, um, and uh, Milehan, I think is the other one. Um, uh, but if I forgot someone, I'm sorry, but uh, that's, uh, you know, they actually go through this construction. They consider, they're very interested in, you know, Milner's invariance uh, up to link homotopy as opposed to um, link concordance. And so we can just use construction, um, which is very helpful. And so um, how do the uh, extended invariance work? Well, what you do is you just take the extended group of the long virtual knot, uh, and uh, you again look at its uh, nilpotent quotients. And so what turns out in this case is that um, for a long virtual knot, uh, you know, the extended group, its nilpotent quotients you know, are just generated by two uh, generators, A and V. You know, the V component corresponds to the, uh, the, the W component in the Jure construction. And you just get an isomorphism with the uh, nilpotent quotient on the free group on two letters. Um, you can define, you know, in the usual way, uh, Milner invariants for these. Uh, there's no indeterminacy in this case, so they're all integer invariants, they're all concordance invariants. Uh, but for calculation purposes, it's a little bit more useful to use this uh, thing called the Artin representation. So um, the Artin representation is you just take um, your uh, long virtual knot and you define a automorphism of the Q plus one term of the lower central series. And uh, you send the auxiliary variable to itself. And then for the other term, you just conjugate by the longitude. But again, the important thing to point out for calculation purposes is that you have to use the longitude that corresponds to the, its image in the uh, no potent quotient. Okay. All right, and so the main theorem, of course, is that you know this um, Artin representation is a concordant invariant of long virtual knots, and um, using that, we'll show that VC is not abelian. And a corollary of this is that there exist uh, non-concordant long virtual knots having concordant closure. So by closure, I just mean you glue the two ends together. Okay, and so the proof is just by calculation. So here um, we have 2.1 and 3.1. And if you compute the uh, extended art and representation of 2.1 times 3.1 and the extended art and representation of 3.1 times 2.1, you can just show that they're not the same. And so I just sort of outlined the calculation there. Um, you know, the, the fee here, this just means the image and the no potent quotient, that's what it looks like. Um, I have a computer program that does this, by the way. Um, so it just writes it out for you. Uh, and you, know, you do it for the other one. So lambda tilde corresponds to 2.1 times 3.1, and lambda tilde star corresponds to 3.1 times 2.1. And uh, then you can just do a calculation to show that um, you know, this doesn't represent the trivial word. Uh, mod F8, and so therefore it means that uh, these two elements don't commute. So you're just showing that the art and representations are, are not the same. Okay, so the art and representation, uh, this is a, a trick that goes back to Habegger and Lin. So I'm just using their argument, but I'm using it for the extended group of the long virtual knot. And so sure enough, you see that they're not abelian. Okay, and you know, just I'll just point out it is pretty easy to calculate even by hand. Um, so if you take, say, a Gauss diagram, um, drawn one there uh, for three point five, um, you know, you can compute the longitudes sort of in the usual way. Um, it's just that you have to account for the fact that there's you know two relations for each crossing. So the way I do it is, you know, if it's an overcrossing arc, you write down one relation. And if it's an undercrossing arc, you write down the other relation, and that turns out to be equivalent to the presentation that you would get if you did it, um, you know, just crossing by crossing. 
Okay, and then you know what you do then is you, you compute these longitudes. Um, for this particular knot, it's pretty short. Um, so you only get up to four, you get something that looks like that. Um, and uh, then you can write each of these as a product of commutators. And then once you written it as a product of commutators, then you can compute the coefficients uh, just using the properties of the Madness expansion. Um, and so again, I learned these properties um, from uh, Roger's book, <laughs> uh, which are explained very nicely. Another good reference is Marshall Hall's um, book on combinatorial group theory. Uh, explains a lot of this very well. And um, you know, for that knot, you can just compute them very easily by hand. And you can show that you, know, you get something uh, or you have these invariants which are not zero. And so that indicates automatically that these are not slice. Okay. Um, you'll notice lots of patterns there. Um, and that's because a lot of these things are linearly dependent, right? And so um, one part of the paper, I you know, give you a, I give you a spanning set um, up to like order 10 or something like that. Um, so it kind of reduces your calculation. You don't need to actually compute all um, 10 of the, well, sorry, that's wrong. Um, all of these uh, invariants, so you only need to compute a couple of them. Uh, get the full power of the Javar invariants. Um, so, and so I'll just leave you with a problem here. And so these are the only four that are left. Um, if you could tell me whether or not they are sliced, I would be very grateful. Very grateful. I would like to stop thinking about this. <laughs> I want to something else. So it would be wonderful if you could tell me whether or not they are sliced. So I, I think I answered your uh, Dale's question there, but uh, you said you wanted to know why. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, You're welcome. Yeah, fa thank you, Micah, for going that extra mile. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Are, are there any other questions? Um, uh, just a quick observation. You didn't tell us why it's J, but it's clear that it's if you put the blue arc over the crossing, then it creates the letter J. Exactly. Yeah. So it's. Uh, uh, if you want to look up, you know, Barnaton's original talks about this, um, they're called like crossing the crossings. So it's okay. on, you can see there's a, a link to it in the papers. So in, in my paper, in my paper, and also my paper with Bowden. So if you want, you can just click on the link and take you to his nice talk. So um, in, in the realm of things that I don't know about, which is pretty much what I'm always talking about. Um, uh, mu bar invariants, Milner invariants can be understood in terms of coefficients of Conway polynomials. Can you reconstruct Conway polynomials from what you're doing? Um, that is a great question. So that is a, a list of things to think about. <coughs> um, so there's, uh, so I'm you know, glad to see uh, Lorenzo Traldi here. Um, you know, he wrote a nice paper um, back um, in the 80s about how the um, the mu bar uh, invariants of two component links, uh, how they're related to the um, you know their vanishing is related to the uh, the vanishing of the uh, multivariable Alexander polynomial, right? Um, so that determines that exactly when that is the case. Um, you know, building on some earlier work by um, or a sugi, right? Um, so that's the first thing I want to think about because I think that would be really interesting. You know, how exactly do the vanishing of these invariants correspond to the vanishing of the, um, you know, the generalized Alexander polynomial? I think that would be a really interesting thing. And then from that, you could try to do something like what Cochran did with the um, coefficients of the Conway polynomial. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to do the, the other part first. <laughs> before we can get to see. <laughs> That's a great question. Any other questions? 
Well, uh, thanks very much, Michael. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Oh, well, nice talk. Nice talk. Thank you. Um, would you mind sending me a copy of your slides? Yes. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I'll do that right now. And, yeah. And um, just a reminder that, that next week, uh, Lou is talking. He, he's continuing his previous talk, but he... He couldn't attend today because of uh, a dental appointment. So I'll um, wish everyone goodbye until next week. And, um, and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.